there is a soul seed within us all that we are here to express. We are all here with a united purpose, and that is to fully realize and express the truth of our soul, the magnificent truth of our soul, which is you are love, I am love. We're all here to fully, fully realize that, express it, and live that fully, the expression of your soul. And that's your soul purpose. But I feel that we have an individual meaning that we apply in each lifetime to that purpose. And that meaning is built on your soul seed. And my soul seed is a healer. Welcome to the Spirit Sisters podcast. My name is Karina Machado, and I'm the author of Spirit Sisters, Women's True Stories of the Paranormal. In this podcast, I'll revisit the women behind my most unforgettable stories and unearth new tales to chill, intrigue, astound and offer hope. You'll hear first-hand accounts of sacred journeys, spirit encounters, near-death experiences, angels, mysteries, marvels and love more powerful than death. Whatever you believe about the afterlife, I invite you to open your minds and hearts as ordinary people reveal their extraordinary encounters. I acknowledge the Darawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land of Sutherland Shire in Australia, where I live and record Spirit Sisters, and I recognise their continuing connection to lands, waters and community. I pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to Elders past, present and emerging. You're listening to Spirit Sisters. I'm your host, Karina Machado. As always, I'm delighted that you're joining me around the virtual fireside today. And we have quite the story for you to warm yourself by tonight. I was on the train this morning, Spanish guitar playing softly in my earbuds, thinking about what to say in the introduction to this very special episode. This week, I welcome my dear friend Sarah back to the podcast. I first interviewed Sarah in the early days of the show in 2019. We recorded a double episode which I published in September and October of that year and I've included those links below. Sarah has a riveting story to tell. Hers is one of the most profound NDEs I've ever encountered, not just because of the beauty and the richness of the experience itself, but also because of the profound repercussions it had on her life, the way it transformed every aspect of her being. Suffice to say that today, she considers herself Sarah 2.0, as she shares in our conversation. From a cardiac diagnostic imaging specialist who gave her all to her patients, a rewarding and very demanding career that she adored, though it ran her ragged, to the survivor of a rare autoimmune condition who, post-NDE, is driven to heal hearts in a new way. Today, Sarah is devoted to sharing the message of her NDE, that love is the essence of who we are and that living true to our soul's purpose is how we ultimately heal. She talks about the soul seed planted within each of us and of finding the courage to let it flourish. She also shares her life review in great detail and you'll hear why this was a highlight of her NDE and how it's still rippling out powerfully in her life today. Keep listening to hear about the healing chamber, about seeing her beloved father and mentor and other loved ones who formed part of a jubilant gathering that Sarah calls the welcoming party. And you'll also hear all about the extraordinary downloads she received about the time and space continuum. There's also an amazing piece around her past lives and how she witnessed them as she was coming back into her body. This is the story of a woman who's had to find a fresh way to honour her training in medicine as she navigates a new path that's aligned at last, to her sole purpose. Speaking of taking new paths, tomorrow Sarah and I are flying to Spain to walk El Camino de Santiago, the way of St James. And as we head out together with open hearts and faith that the Camino delivers, I will also be cherishing the opportunity to walk towards and through Galicia, mystical land of my great-grandparents. I'm finally walking towards my story, and I have the deep honour of doing that with a soul friend by my side. At the end of the show, we have some exciting news to share about a collaboration that we trust will water the little soul seeds within us 
and perhaps within you as well. You'll find links below to our new podcast, Soul to Soul Conversations, as well as links to Sarah's charity, The Autoimmune Project. We hope you'll come and walk with us. Until then, buen camino. Welcome to Spirit Sisters, Sarah. Hello, Karina. <laughs> How many years later? It was September 2019. We're approaching four years later. Oh, I We're... cannot believe that. I want to say I cannot believe how much time has passed, but I can't say that because it doesn't feel like much has passed at all. I know how you feel about time, mm. so I want to ask you about that. Yesterday was your birthday. Yes, happy birthday to me. <laughs> Do you remember what happened when I said happy birthday, Sarah? I actually don't. Isn't that weird? You said, is it my birthday? <laughs> I never know when it's my, is it really my birthday, you said. <laughs> That's right. I just don't know. Since the NDE, time means nothing to me. No. It's very hard to live in a concept of time, which must be very frustrating to, <laughs> to you now, now that we've become such good friends, because I'm constantly, and anyone who knew me prior to my NDE knew that I was the time Nazi, completely ruled by, we have to be everywhere 10 minutes early, we have to be on time. However, in my NDE, I was shown in a download the time space energy continuum and how time does not exist as we construct it here in human physical form and now that i've come back and i'm doing this life in human physical form again i'm very aware that time has spaciousness that time has energy that it's an interconnected the unified fields of time and space and energy have this inter interconnected relationship with one another so that time can expand, time mm -hmm. can contract, energy can infuse through it. And it's just this be beautiful, fluid representation of all three together as we're walking through it. And I find it very hard to look at a clock now and say, oh, it's 10 o'clock or it's my birthday. I I do set alerts on my phone like everyone to make sure I turn up somewhere when I'm meant to. Other than that, I find it very hard to live by time. Well, we're here today, tonight. We've got hot chips. Yes, delicious hot chips. <laughs> We've got a glass of mm -hmm. verve and we are getting together mm -hmm. to catch up, to follow up, I guess, mm -hmm. on our original interview nearly four years ago to talk about mm -hmm. everything that's happened yeah. since, but also to to revisit the NDE mm. because having gotten to know you over the last few years, I know there was a lot that you left mm. out and it, it's really, there's no, you know, there's no accusation there or anything. It's mm. just that it was so very fresh when we spoke, it was within the year. And I remember you saying to me at one point, as we've been going on our training walks for the Camino, which we'll talk about later, you said, that's just run out of my head. <laughs> You said... I think like any experience in life, let's think about something amazing like your wedding day or the birth of a baby, something amazing, miraculous that has so many components to it. If I was to talk to you about it the next day, you would say it was such a blur. I, don't, I remember this, this and this. But if I was to talk to you about it five years later or ten years later, there'll be parts of that day that you come to realise were very important parts yes. of that day. And that as you get, I'm going to say older, but I, would, I will say as your soul sits with the experience and also has the ability to really reconcile it all as you are walking back through the experience in the physical, the insights become a lot more profound over time as you are integrating them into your life as i as i have found the insights that i brought back with me the knowledge the downloads weren't fully formed as a full understanding in my own human limited computer mind they were not fully formed because our soul has such a higher intelligence higher understanding higher knowledge because it's a higher consciousness the mind is so limited in trying to understand 
fully what is in the non-physical compared to what is the physical existence that we all are so conditioned to understand. So it's probably taken me four years to really reconcile what the experience truly not only meant to me, but the beautiful insights and understandings and knowledge that came with it and how it's informed my life moving forward. And I, I think when we spoke, I'd only spoken to one other person about it briefly and no one else. And there were parts of it that I didn't fully understand that I intentionally didn't talk about, but the rest I thought I'd actually thought I'd mentioned, but I didn't probably because mm. I wasn't used to being interviewed and yeah. wasn't used to talking about something that is very hard to discuss anyway, not because it's a hard topic to discuss, but because we don't have we do not have the words in the English language or any other. I've spent four years now looking at all the other languages to try and find words that may describe the experience more adequately. But they're just in no language are there the words that are needed to fully describe the experience. It's just impossible. I think any anyone who listens to or reads a lot of mm. near-death experiences will understand what you're saying mm. in the sense that so many near-death experiences mm. express that, that it's an ineffable experience, mm. that it's, there, it's exactly as mm. you said, there aren't the words in our language to convey it. Mm. So we get that. And I think what I was trying to say before was another aspect, something that you said to me, mm. was that you didn't think that it was something perhaps that people would be interested in. Yeah, that's true. Because <laughs> that, you're, very, you're very humble and you're just, <laughs> oh, really? Well, people want to hear about the healing chamber or the guides mm. or the um, a soul purpose? Mm. Yes, Sarah, <laughs> yes, and that's why we're here. But before we get into all of mm. that, I think it would be great if mm. you just gave a brief recap of what took you okay. to the end here. Remember earlier you said you're just going to give the cliff mm. notes. Yep, okay. Give the cliff notes. Let's try and do that. So for anyone who hasn't listened to my previous interviews, I have a very rare autoimmune condition called neurocardiobachets. As with all autoimmune conditions, it means the immune system no longer recognises parts of your body and as your own and starts attacking it. So for me, it's been my joints, it's been my heart and my brain, and I have had systemic involvement, but the most important aspects are it was my it was as if my body was rejecting my own heart so and I was put on anti-rejection therapy along with all the other treatment that you would use for autoimmune disease ultimately 10 years in I was in after having a heart attack or a cardiac infarct a heart attack after having myocarditis pericarditis which is inflammation of the heart myocarditis is inflammation of the muscle and fluid around the heart which compresses the heart my heart was not in great shape so I was in heart failure I had had a stroke and eight episodes of meningitis some of them encephalomeningitis leading up to the NDE I had developed meningitis I was in heart failure I developed meningitis and was taken to St George Hospital and was there for I think it was three weeks and started on our usual therapy when I'm failing I probably should also say I was six months into weekly chemotherapy of the highest dose of cyclophosphamide so I was failing on that so our last sort of hope I was failing on which meant back to hospital trying to keep me somewhat alive while we wait for approval there was one drug that had been used overseas that had had wonderful results in two people which we thought may be my lifeline the approval process takes a while so I was put on very high doses of pulsed prednisone for a week a thousand milligrams a day which is a lot and that helps to calm down the inflammation in the brain and the heart and got me to a point where I was allowed home but I was still very much touch and go waiting for approval for the new immunotherapy biologic drug which I was advised could take three to four weeks 
which I was also advised I didn't have. If I deteriorated, I was to come back to hospital and start the intense treatment again to keep, try and keep me going. So I was, I went home. I didn't want to stay in hospital. I wanted to be with my children and I didn't want to spend any more. I'd spent a lot of time over the last 10 years in hospital and I just didn't want to do it. I wanted to go home to my bed. I wanted to go home to my children and my family who were two hours away who couldn't come and visit me. So I existed in a very, very restricted form of life at home, um, meaning couldn't care for myself, couldn't get out of bed. The meningitis that had been calmed down was coming back. So my brain was fully inflamed again. Um, breathing, I, I was aware my body was starting to tick down. So that breathing became very hard. I was in excruciating pain with meningitis. And the day of my NDE, I woke up with a knowing of sorts. I would now say it was a soul knowing, but at the time I didn't understand what that meant. <laughs> now I understand. I had a knowing that I would not be here the next day and I didn't want to go back to hospital and not be able to say goodbye to my children and also knowing there wasn't really much to be done. So I think having so much inflammation in the brain may also makes it hard to make decisions accurately maybe that played a part but I'm pretty stubborn and I felt stable enough and I didn't know what to think about that knowing and my children went off to school that day I spent the day trying to work out what I would say to them if it was the last time I spoke to them they came home and we had a little system where they would come home and because I couldn't leave my bedroom, I was, when you have meningitis, the light. <laughs> I'd had chemotherapy, so I didn't have hair. I had a big scarf around my head to keep it warm. I had sunglasses on because I couldn't handle any light from a light bulb or sun or a TV or I just, so I literally looked like a Hollywood movie star in bed with the dark sunnies and the big scarf around my head. <laughs> the children would come home and they would spend, as they had done for the months leading up to this throughout my whole treatment, a couple of hours just in the bed with me talking about their day, doing some homework, chatting. It was my favourite thing. And that day was like all of those. It's interesting when things get taken out of your life, how the little things start to take on so much more importance. They become very important. I spoke to them all as best I could and they went off to bed as young children do, maybe 8, 39. And I could feel myself, I guess the only way I can say it is shutting down. I was aware of it internally, which is a weird thing to say, but I was aware of it. When my husband, then husband came in, we, I told, he asked how I was. My head was just, if you've, if you've had a meningitis, you'd understand. If you haven't, my head was just excruciating. The chest pain was crushing. I was in an enormous amount of pain and nothing could, nothing really touched it. So I guess my husband was asking how my pain was. Um, my answer to him was, I need to tell you that I don't think I'm going to be here tomorrow and he wanted immediately to take me to the hospital and I said oh please just let me have another night in my bed and I will go tomorrow if I'm still here and he wasn't pleased with that answer but I said I've spent too many years in hospital I'm just give me another night here I guess I talked him into it he came to bed and went to sleep I was in too much pain to sleep and I remember lying there thinking it was like almost like light switches being turned off inside my body and I remember being very conscious of trying to breathe breathing became tricky and then it was like all the pain stopped and I was aware of the most beautiful peaceful feeling and I had no pain anymore and I was at complete peace and it was like it was wrapping around me and then I felt my energy draining out of my body and I will say it was through my feet. That might be a very weird thing to say, but I was aware that my energy drained out through my feet. 
and then I was aware that I was above my body at ceiling height looking down at my body that I will say looked very weird from that perspective because you don't look like what you think you're going to look like and I think once your energy leaves your physical form it no longer looks like you. I think the other thing that struck me in retrospect looking back was I actually was not thinking this is weird or I I didn't I didn't question it I didn't think it was weird I didn't get distressed that I was looking at my body and then I was obviously no longer alive I was very detached from my body I just looked at it and went hmm that's interesting I didn't want to be back in my body I don't know how long I was in that state looking observing my body maybe a few minutes on the other thing that I was very aware of was even though I was no longer in my physical form in my body I felt exactly like I did when I was in my physical body exactly the same I obviously didn't have a body because that was my body that I was looking at but I felt like I had a body like I didn't look through eyes that I no longer had but I had awareness that was looking now. So I was no longer looking through the physical human eyes. Now what was observing was my awareness, just my pure awareness. That is what our soul consciousness observes with, our awareness. So I was viewing the world through my awareness of my soul. And I became aware of And I don't want to call it a pulling sensation, but it was like an anti-gravity, like the ceiling of the house no longer existed. And I was aware of the most magnificent, bright, white light that was not light. It was love. I knew instantly that that was love and that was where I belonged. That's where I came from and that's where I'm going to. And it was alive, it was consciousness, it was this white light was conscious and I was part of that consciousness, connected, interconnected, one, unified. And I felt that's the direction that my that I went I went towards the light. And I don't want to say it was up and I don't want to say what direction it was in because somewhat like time, I find it hard to say there was a direction. Although it was probably in a physical sense above me. I wanted to go towards it. I was compelled to go there. And again, I can't say it was a tunnel. I will just say that I moved my awareness, my soul, went towards the bright, white, beautiful light that was magnificent love. And that was home. And that we could call God or source or whatever they're all right divine (laughs) love universe they're just words to describe the same thing although on arrival I do remember and I'd like to say I was what I was thinking but I no longer had a mind to think so my consciousness was aware that's God and God is love oh my goodness I can't believe that I had spent my whole youth being told that my mother is religious and I can remember being told when I was very little God is love and those words meant nothing to me until that moment where it meant everything God is love so if we want to take God out of it we can say that is love it's the foundation of consciousness it's the foundation of everything we are created from love we return to love we are part of love it is within us it's within all of us I knew that I had gone home or I'd arrived back home and I couldn't believe that I'd forgotten that this was home and I felt the human form the life that I had just lived I thought that was my home but it became very obvious in my awareness that I had just had amnesia and I had forgotten that this was my home it felt like it does when you come home after not being there for a very very long time when you go on go on a holiday for a month and you come home and you can't wait to just walk in the door and have your cup of tea out of your favorite cup and Mm -hmm. put your favorite slippers on that feeling like that but way more magnificent 
beautiful, beautiful, magnificent, unconditional love. And I had an awareness of, I would have said maybe previously other beings, but the correct way for me to address them are my guides. There were three guides as I arrived into that white light to become one with it again, one with all consciousness, my individual soul consciousness returning back to one consciousness. I was aware of one who seemed to be, I don't want to say superior, but a more, a larger presence. And then two other guides, the one in front of me, that with the larger presence had a very feminine energy but I don't want to say that she was female or male just that there was a feminine energy and the two other guides either side had a masculine energy it has nothing to do with being female or male it's just the feminine I think I've heard it referred to as the divine feminine and the divine masculine and that was the beginning of my life review and it was communicated to me telepathically so my guides communicated to me no it was my the main guide not the other two the main one communicated that we were I don't know that the word review was used I think it was I actually don't know what word we used but I don't think it was review I know I didn't come back knowing the term life review I only learnt that when I talked to you originally I think yeah, okay. but I knew I was going to view my last incarnation I knew it was a viewing and an observation, not to judge it, but to assess, not lay any positive or negative to it, but just as an assessment. And it was, none of this was spoken with words. It was all telepathic, energetic words that seemed to be transferred between myself and my guides that I understood it was a language I knew how to speak I didn't have to learn it I knew I I knew instantly how to do it so the viewing I didn't see my whole life but it was like a big projection on an invisible screen <laughs> like the drive-in movies you know if when I don't know if everyone knows like oh, showing how old I am I remember them. Yeah, <laughs> I remember going to the drive-in getting in the car going and sitting and watching the big enormous screen It was like a big enormous screen and the projection was parts of my life being shown. So as with everything in this dimension, the love dimension, which is what I call it, there are boundaries if I say there's a wall or a floor or a screen. That's the only way to describe it, even though they're invisible, even though there's no. So there wasn't really a screen that something was projected onto, but the energetic representation of components of my life lived were being visually screened in front of me and it was a full energetic representation in which I actually partook in it it wasn't just observation it was viewing reviewing and partaking in choices and actions words situations in my life so that I could experience that particular scene again not just as how I lived it how I turned up but as the other person that was present in that scene of my life playing out if it was a beautiful positive interaction in which I had done said said something done an action that made that other person feel immense happiness joy worth and had huge ripple effects on through their life so it may in turn have made them turn to kind acts towards others then I would live that as them how they felt how their lived experience of it was on the other hand if I had said or done something that had caused pain or suffering to another then I also experienced that as the other had experienced it in that moment and I was also able to view the repercussions of that throughout their life and that's a very powerful experience to view all the major and not so major some some of them were quite what you would maybe classify as trivial (laughs) are you able to give us an example of one of them 
One of them was when I was in primary school, in Australia primary schools, up to 10 or 11 years of age, I would have been in fifth class, so probably 10 years old, or maybe nine. And it was at the beginning of the year, beginning of the school year. I had been at this school for already five years. So you have formed friendships, you have very connected friendships with others and everyone's and it was an all-girls school so girls are very clicky and you have your little groups and being the beginning of the year a few new girls started and as with every school some of them just quickly float in and become friends with everyone and there was one girl who no one wanted to sit next to no one wanted to talk to and I had remembered my mother always saying to me be the person that be the person that's always the friend and I got up from my little group and I wasn't a very popular girl by any means but I did have one friend and my sister was also at the school and I got up and went and sat next to this girl and said hi my name's Sarah we might have only been sitting five meters away but I said would you like to come and sit with us and have lunch with us and chatted and included her I was showing that and you would think that's nothing that's Mm. just but I was showing how that made her feel I experienced it as her and then I was able to see the ripple effects throughout her life of how then she instructed her life that way in how she treated others later on in positions like work positions where she had higher positions and how she always made sure everyone felt included and extended that and so it that one little act, one little day, five little minutes, that, that was in there. That is so powerful. Mm. So the insignificant, how our human mind judges it, those little insignificant, they are not insignificant. They are powerful and they really speak to what I learnt in my time over on the other side, in the other dimension of why we are truly here in human form. Why are we doing this life experience? Why are we all here doing this to turn up as love for one another in every moment to connect, to be connected because we are connected. We are all one. I am you, you are me. We are, if we want to say divine God, source, we are all part of source. We are all part of divine. We are all part of God. I think we were talking earlier, Karina, when I was saying no term is wrong. Mm. They all mean the same. We're all referring to the same thing. And how I was highlighting to me, I call you my friend. Your daughter calls you mum. Your husband would call you wife. You are a different name to all of us, but we are all referring to you, to the same person mm, to the same wonderful entity example yeah so we all have whatever whatever term we're comfortable using or whatever term resonates with us they're all correct but they're all really referring to love mm. this magnificent unconditional powerful merciful love that creates that created everything mm. and that we come here to create from love as well mm. And that reminds me of the gift you gave me when I turned 50, the necklace. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah, so it's a beautiful little gold pendant and on the back is inscribed, what would love do? Yeah. And what, tell me about yeah. that message. So that follows on from what you were just yeah. saying. Coming back, I, the, my life review, as I now know how to term it, it has really instructed how I live my life going forward now in that I would like to walk every moment that I get fully expressing who I am and I know that to be love so I wake up with the intent every morning firstly to say thank you because it's a beautiful gift that we're here it's a beautiful gift to have another day to have another day to play here but also to anchor into that intent and remind myself in every moment no matter what moment turns up and we all know this human experience they're not all what we would classify or term as good Some of them are, and I don't even really like using the word challenging, but for the sake of using a word to label it, some situations are challenging. They're a little bit tricky to navigate and 
it is harder to turn up as love for another in a circumstance that may be uncomfortable or difficult or giving you the potential and opportunity for your own soul growth. And that often feels a little bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And the true trick is to turn to love, to turn back to who you are, what we know, what I know, we are all here to be is just be love. So I, I made a necklace for myself because in the moments that I found, I really wanted to anchor into that. I would hold on to it. That's mm, what I do too. Yeah. yeah, just hold on to it and know that's what I wanted to anchor into in that moment for another. I think only recently, and it, it's, I have to say, it has been the last four years. It has been a a continual expansion of understanding and insight that has kept unfolding for me in the human existence of what these concepts really look like and feel like in the lived experience. And I think the the concept of non-judgment, which we we all talk about as you know, not not judging another, not judging self, that was another, I think, aspect that I took away from my life review was I'm not here to judge another. I'm not here to judge myself. That's not what that's not what this whole show is about. It's not about judging. But it's very easy to fall back into that in your conditioned way of living. Even even with a near death experience, you come back into human form and you start living a very human life again. And I like everyone, I trip over, I fall over, I get myself back up, I dust myself off, but I really do try and catch myself very quickly afterwards and take accountability and say, that is not how I wish to show up. What happened five minutes ago, one minute ago, that is not who I am and that is not how I wish to show up. Can we do that again? And can I really express what I want to be in this moment? And that is, I want to be love for you. And I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm talking about the foundation of who we are to allow another to live their life without judgment, without you bringing to them what you think they should live their life like, without you getting offended if it's not what you think you want from them, to fully dissolve expectation, to fully dissolve judgment, to understand you are not even here to forgive. To forgive, that's even a judgment that they need your forgiveness. That's, I, don't, I don't even think that's our role. The life review is very, very powerful and it has every day, every day I'm very aware of what I want my next one to look like and I would like it very much to look like love. That's been a very big undercurrent of what I've been undertaking personally over the last four years of how do I step through the moments of my life knowing I'm turning up as love in each and every moment. It's a really beautiful gift. The life review is a beautiful gift to have experienced and it's not nice watching things when you watch how you may have said something that really hurt another. And I really don't want to experience that again because mm. it is, I guess it's what we would call heaven or hell, the life review. If you have lived this life with the intent of love, with the intent of serving others, with the intent of being compassionate love, your life review would be what we would classically term, inverted commas, heaven. However, if you've lived a life where you haven't honoured those things and maybe disregarded them as important in your life, your life review may feel to you like you are in hell. Yeah, especially if, as you said, you're in a position where you're able to be in the other person's shoes mm. and feel what they felt, mm. that terrible ache in them or pain. And not only that, but see how that impacted their life going mm. forward and created their own kind of hell for their mm. the people in their life in their community in their home yeah. so it, wow. it really isn't just viewing it it yeah. is really almost i would say reliving the past which is interesting because there isn't a past and there isn't a future there is only the now all time exists in the now which is why you can relive it as the other meaning you are them and they are you. The concepts of being you, separate identity, and not being, not holding that connection with you within you to all 
and also the concept of time, both of them are dissolved in a life review. Takes it off the table. They don't exist because you become the other and you also become all time. So that situation, from what I'm hearing, is showing to you what really is, how life really is, is you are the other mm. and there only is the now. And as mm. above, so below. Mm. It's the same here, except mm. we just don't remember that. Mm. And I think the other important thing is your intent really comes through and it really comes through in the life review. Mm. Your intent is stamped on your consciousness on all consciousness. That is what's stamped on it. That's imprinted on that energetic consciousness of that moment in time, which is what's being expressed in it. It's intent comes before the thought, comes before the word, comes before the action. So you're viewing the energetic expression of intent in that moment that is co-creating with another. So you are really viewing, experiencing your intent. That's what's stamped on the mm. on all consciousness so i came back also understanding how very important intent is mm. for, the, for all the years i've known you now about four or so mm. you've always spoken a lot about intent mm. intent and soul of course is mm. the other word that has mm. really come back stamped on you I know. <laughs> and i it's interesting because pre-nde i don't think i ever said the word soul i don't think i ever thought about, read about, questioned, queried, verbally said the word. It's so interesting. And considering I had a previous NDE, but it was not like this. It wasn't a fully formed near-death experience. It was a it was a death experience that was very quick in time. And I don't like using time, but it was a very fleeting experience out of body. And I watched myself in an operation and I watched myself dying on the table and I was clinically dead and I was observing it but I was told I was not I was not meant to be here basically I, I arrived and I said you're not meant to be here and flicked back to my body pretty quick I didn't even give that much thought and now I'm <laughs> I'm actually looking back and thinking that's quite ridiculous Sarah why didn't you even <laughs> think about that much but I got busy with I had a little baby I had little kids I yeah yeah, I wasn't ready I wasn't ready and I got very distracted in the life of young children and I think pushed it way way down way down knowing if I start talking about this people are going to think I'm absolutely crazy and I did feel that after this death experience and that's the other thing I have a lot of trouble calling it near-death experience because there's nothing near about it. It mm. is a death experience. You clinically die. You have a death experience. The fact that you come back doesn't mean it was near. Mm. It just means you die and you come back. For me, I got the choice. But we'll get to that. Yeah. So, okay, so so life review. You had the life review. Is there anything else you want to share around that? Or did you want to move on to what happened after that? I think, I look, as with everything in life, I, I get a few more years on and I realize there's probably some other important insights to this that I don't fully understand yet and that may be but at the moment that's the level to which I've been unable to understand and comprehend it and express it in human terms and you do a beautiful job of that Sarah Mm, thank you it's a struggle it is (laughs) it is a struggle I, I do find myself feeling very limited and very inadequate with how I can convey something that doesn't have the physicality of this world and I think it's like trying to explain a banana to someone who's never seen a banana before in their life it's very hard to explain what the color is what it tastes like what the shape is Mm. if you have amnesia if it's foreign to you in this moment it's it's very hard to express it but it's probably going to be my life work trying to do it and I'm okay with that because I'm as you know I'm quite obsessed with talking about soul now it seems to be all I can talk about (laughs) Uh, after that I became so my guides were with me but they were not necessarily partaking in the review at all it was really me assessing me observing assessing experiencing 
and it was not by any means an exercise in judgment it was not by any means an exercise in look how good you did or look how bad you did that was there's no that like I said there's no judgment either way it's just neutral it's just a neutral assessment of and maybe the potential for soul growth even in that moment even to let that settle deep in the soul I'm very lucky it's something I've come back with the knowledge of with a remembrance of after that I was very aware off to I'm going to say right um, in my field of awareness I was very aware of my father who had passed who had transitioned in the March of that year and this was November so he had transitioned before I had started the intensive chemotherapy I was I was quite sick when he passed I had been sick for years but I had deteriorated and was lining up to start the chemotherapy when he passed and I was so delighted to see him he was dressed as I would have seen him probably when he was he was his physical appearance so he he represented himself in physical form of when he was about 40. So young, healthy, vibrant, maybe a bit younger, maybe 35, but just curly, healthy, curly hair and just robust round face, cheeks and healthy glow. And he was in a suit as he always was, immaculately dressed in a suit and tie. And he was coming towards me and he had his hands stretched out to me both hands in front of him stretched out like I think you would imagine if you reference a a father to a young child come you know Mm. come to me with both hands out and we again communicated how I had been communicating with my guides a telepathic energetic communication and he expressed his great love for me and I for him and he expressed how he was aware of all that had happened while in the interim period from Mm -hmm. when I had last seen him and how proud he was of my fight and how proud he was of how I'd handled all I'd been through he called me Sari Fairy which he used to call me when I was a little girl and he it's hard to say when I say well we walked because there's no floor to walk on we turned and when I say we turned meaning he placed his awareness and he he turned to face to around behind him but in the distance a little bit so my awareness was guided to where he was facing and I would like to say it was a room I knew it was a space that I was to go to next and he communicated that to me. We started moving towards it and when we got to the door, which was invisible, but it was a door, (laughs) he stopped and he halted and I knew I had to keep proceeding through. Now my guides hadn't, they weren't with me when I was with my father, but as I walked through the door, they were there with I would say another three beings and it was what I call it a chamber it had a it was a space with boundary it was an enclosed area that felt safe and healing even though I can't say there were walls or there was something physical to say that there were boundaries between this space and where I had just been I knew there was and I knew I was within a healing chamber and I went into the middle center of it's a circular shape building (laughs) structure and I was from my lead guide instructed to lie down so if I had a physical form which I guess I had a soul body phantom body Mm, sometimes it's called the etheric body oh is it that thing (laughs) (laughs) i had that thing (laughs) that lay down and all the guy my my master guide was at my head 
and then my two soul guides beside and then the other three were at my lower body and at the base of me and they communicated that this would be the healing of my soul it was the vibration of healing it was like a hum there's nothing here that I can liken it to um, no sound or no music but it was exquisite exquisite hum that they all emitted and it passed through through me like like warm liquid like warm liquid just flowing and washing through me washing over me infusing me I felt like the best massage <laughs> I've only ever had one but it felt like a beautiful massage for the soul almost like a healing pulsing energetic healing session I cannot tell you how long that went on for so beautiful it was Love it. I could say it was suspended in time that it mm. was as long as it needed to be and it was just this most beautiful love healing it was a it was a love healing and it mm. was on it was sound so I don't know how to explain how you know things but I knew as it was coming to an end the vibration got lower not lower in amplitude but in volume in volume mm. it, it's like turning the knob down and then it was just sort of like a, a, a space of silence you know how we say have silence here have a moment of silence it was it was like just a a silent hug or a, it was just a beautiful sacred moment suspended and then I got up and I knew to leave the chamber and I walked out the door again and my father was there waiting and he just again held his hands out to me to beckon me to come to him and then he looked in the other direction off to the right far and as I looked over and placed my awareness in that direction I was very aware that wherever I placed my awareness it was as if consciousness unfolded there or there was an expansion and an unfolding with whatever direction I put my awareness on or whatever I placed it on seemed to have the capabilities to expand and unfold infinitely so your awareness your focus on something so, created so if we think in human form our awareness is really directed by our sight our eyes are our portal to our world and our awareness we direct our awareness in human form by what we're looking at so we turn our head and our awareness is looking at a TV or yeah. looking at another person. Yeah. You shut your eyes, then you may be able to turn your awareness within, to inside, mm. into your internal experience. But most of the time in human form, we are living very much through our exterior environment and our awareness is placed exterior to us. And if we look around this room here, wherever we place our awareness or turn our our head to and that's where our awareness is placed it's not unfolding it's not expanding the room doesn't become this magical expansion of room what I saw was it's, it was like like looking at it was like looking at a fog that just kept unraveling before my eyes or before my awareness it just kept unraveling and it was like watching the universe expanding with the power of my awareness it was as if my awareness had the power to create and it does I don't know very much about quantum physics but whenever you share that and you've shared it with me a couple of times and I, I just I'm lost in that description when you say it it's so beautiful but it, I do think of quant quantum physics and the observer effect mm. And how that mm. you know that is yes. so instrumental when you do reference that that is proven that things are that are observed act differently yeah they, their behavior changes right. under observation a particle or, the, or a wave your energy is communication and so that's another thing it's all connected this every atom everything is connected we are all connected to everything not just to each other mm. and not just to source we're connected to 
every part of consciousness that means all the plants all the animals earth all of consciousness we are all one so if awareness acts in that way in that dimension then bring it back to this dense human physical life we are creating with our awareness here think about it what we place our awareness on whether it be sitting at my desk writing Mm. i'm placing my awareness on the paper the pen and i'm writing in front of me i am creating in that moment my reality with my awareness and then when you in the flow of that Mm. when you're really in alignment with your soul and you're really doing the work that you're here to do or the meaning that you assign to this purpose of your life you get into a flow state and that's when the moments expand Mm. time expands yes i've experienced that awareness does interact with time and space and energy we are in co-creation with everything and we are interacting Mm. with it all and we can manipulate it all with our awareness Mm. and that's why you have a flow state because you access that component of soul that is shining its awareness on an action it's in physical form but then it also can do it in non-physical form you are creating all of your reality through your awareness and then your intent and then your intent is becomes thought and then your th- thought or word or action everything that happened today you created first you placed your intent on it then you said something did something you created breakfast or you created a piece of writing or you went for a walk you created your reality from your intent and we do that in physical form and we do that in non-physical form and that's how i understand the disparity or the discussion about how can how can all these near-death experiences be so different how can they all differ so much from one person to the next and the only way the only explanation that i have is that because just because you are no longer in physical form does not mean you are no longer creating your reality you still create your reality with your intent there are common themes in a near death in near death experiences just as there are common themes in the lived human experience um, common theme we all breathe but i might breathe slower or faster than you but we're still breathing yeah. we're doing it differently we all eat you might like toast and i might like bread we're both eating we're both having the experience of eating we're even eating the same thing it's just the experience is a little bit different because yours is toast and mine's bread we both sleep i might sleep on my tummy you might sleep on your back we're both sleeping we're both having the same experience but a little bit different a little bit unique to me and you we create within the theme our experience they're just guided by our intent of how we want that experience to be makes it a little bit different and that's how i understand we don't judge everyone has a different experience in human form i don't say oh goodness me how can everyone have such different experiences why are not all the experiences the same oh that can't be life that can't be true because everyone's having a different experience well i think it's the same we're all having a different experience in non-physical form as we do in physical form Mm. it doesn't make it any less real Mm -hmm. or any less true it has to be that way because we are all unique soul consciousness we join back to one consciousness which means there is the common themes of a death experience you go to the same place the same dimension Mm. you will go to the same the the beautiful white magnificent love the light is definitely a common a common experience in the nda and love yeah yes the love the love the love and the peace that you described as well peace it's all love so back to my experience healing chamber we We finished that we'd left that i was yes i was with my father again and he was excited he was his energy was very excited and he was directed my attention to 
just off to the other sort of off to the side of where we had been looking I think he wanted to show me everything was intentional he really wanted to show me what awareness did it was very important that I observed the power of awareness and the power of how it creates and how it can expand and interact with space energy and time it's your power mm. it is your soul consciousness's power to create and it informs intent which informs your reality if you look at your day you look at your months you look at your years you are creating every moment whether you want to own up to it or not you are creating it you are creating your sentences you are what we say to one another mm. there is intent behind every word there is intent behind every action i've just decided to be very intentional with my intent to mm. really really be very aware of how how i want to express myself anyway i should get back to the next part of my death experience we went so we started moving forward and the energy was very exciting and in front of me it was what I call the welcoming party so it was if you could imagine lining a street but it wasn't a street but lines of, it's like a parade like you're going to walk down a parade and you're you're what they're here to watch <laughs> you're they're all lined up to watch you parade down the middle but that's that's what it was like for me <laughs> I and it. I had everyone I had known family friends important people people that mattered so much in my human existence were there and it was it was all I can say it was almost like there weren't balloons but it was almost like a big party and they were all so excited that I was there it was welcoming so happy to see me so happy that I was there so delighted and celebrating me and were these people you recognize from this incarnation only so in in the welcoming party everyone there were from this previous this life that I had just lived okay everyone there and it was family first so people who'd passed people who had had all transitioned yep. up until then and even before my birth so before my birth but from this lifetime, my father's grand, my father's parents, I had not met in this lifetime. They had died before I was born, but I knew them. Wow. I knew it was them. Did they present as people in in they clothes? all had they all had physical representation. Yeah. Everyone had physical representation. Everyone was young. Everyone was healthy. Everyone was happy. Uh, the people that were there that I had known in my human existence in that previous life as Sarah, they represented themselves in the way I knew them and in the most, I think, healthy version of themselves, mm. young, healthy, but how I would recognise them. And there were friends from, I had lost one of my best my best friend from school had died in a car accident a few weeks after we finished school oh my gosh Sarah I don't know if I knew that mm. it was it was a really really hard mm. time I it was the first time I had experienced losing someone I loved so much and she was so beautiful and so creative and so lovely to everyone and it was very tragic she was there mm. and she was gorgeous and so happy and it was I remember looking at her and going oh you're here <laughs> it was it was a very it was like the best Christmas day where everyone comes and everyone just is having the best time and as I was proceeding along further into this welcoming party I hit a point that had no physical sign of it being there but it was like I was walking up to a an invisible wall or a threshold or like a threshold of a door and I knew 
the energy of it. I knew if I stepped over that threshold or went through past that point, that would be it. I wouldn't be coming, I wouldn't be able to go back. So I don't know, like I said, I don't know how I knew that, but I I knew and I turned to face my father because he had been proceeding by my side. I guess it was his assignment to show me the ropes, which I was very grateful for. I turned to him, I turned to face him and asked him telepathically what I, is this right? If I keep going, does that mean I don't get to go back? And he confirmed that. He looked at me and he said, yes, fairy fairy, again, you can come with me and we can keep going and you will be healthy, pain-free, there will be no more suffering. And I say suffering in inverted commas, but you can come and that's okay. You can come or you don't have to. You don't have to go any further and you can go back. And he made it very clear that the choice was mine and there was no right or wrong choice. Neither was neither was better than the other. I can't even say there was a moment between like a full stop at the end of a sentence and my next one. I just instantly, instantaneous, just, I know if you could yell telepathically, energetically communicating in a yell, no, no, I just, wanted to be back with my babies with my children the my love for my babies was just and I hadn't thought of it's in that whole time through the whole experience I had not given my previous my life that I had just left any thought I know I had reviewed a life but it was not in a I miss that or I it it didn't have any of that connotation with it it wasn't as if I was yearning to go back there or looking at it made me sad that I wasn't Mm. still living that life I had not at any point thought about it right up until that point and then at that point I just could not not go back I just Mm. and so in the instant that I said that like that energetic moment it was as if I had just been, it was like whoosh, started a free falling, like fast, 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 like the fastest roll. And I hate roller coasters. It was <laughs> so do I. It was so fast. <laughs> it was not a nice feeling. I just, if you had a tummy in yeah. that non physical soul yeah. form, it was tumbling, not tumbling, but a very, very fast. And this is when you saw your past lives yes. as well. Yes, so as I was falling, mm. it was as if I had been plugged into the universe, like grab a big power cord, plug me in, and it was like this information freeway of downloads, flashing, flashing, past lives, time-space energy, unified fields, like just all of them, how they interact, how, they, how they're you know interrelated and just how it all works and I was like oh yeah of course that makes that makes perfect sense it's very easy isn't it like (laughs) it but just all these downloads of and I don't want to say future events but some things that have eventuated since coming back I wasn't it's not like I was given a whole lot of information about the life I would live but I was also and I I know it's like it was really really fast so how could so much happen well, that's because your brain's still thinking in time and time didn't exist. Yeah. But also very much a meeting of a new soul contract of what I was in that choice means I come back with a new contract for the next life, Sarah 2.0. And it was communicated to me that I would, and it wasn't, you have to it wasn't like a demand it wasn't it was just an agreement it was just a very pleasant agreement of yeah that sounds great where do I sign that I am to come back and share my story and to come back and tell everyone it's all love really simple we're all just here to be love in every moment everything the foundation of everything is love physical and non-physical this dimension that dimension it's what energetically runs through all of us and connects us all 
it's a truth that we all know whether we want to look at it and really recognize it I think everyone here looks at another and knows it at some point in their life this is what we're here for yeah. we're here for love that's the truth of it so free falling not a great experience getting back into a human body not a great experience your consciousness has expanded once you leave your body it expands and it becomes very light you, you become light it's it's like you leave a big heavy clunky body behind and you become very light and expansive and zooming down and I came back in through my head I left through my feet mm. and I came back in through my head so so like pouring energy back into yeah. my body but I do remember feeling where do I put it all yeah. where, do, where do I put all my energy how do I fit it all in mm. and then remember feeling this is really heavy and this is really tight it was like pulling on a really small pair of jeans <laughs> <laughs> that's never fun no it was not it was just like can someone open the zipper yeah. <laughs> like it's just, it's just a squeeze <laughs> so I was very aware of that I was very aware of oh this is really not this is not this is clunky and heavy and very dense mm. after feeling so light and expansive and in the human humanness of the moment not the soul not the soul experience but in the back in the human body and the human experience it was I have to breathe again like I've hadn't had to do that like like gasping for air wow. trying to get and that's what that was my first human experience of being back in body was <gasps> trying to breathe yeah. which woke my husband up me trying to breathe woke him up and he I guess because of the discussion we had had previously was would have had very much on his mind he instantly grabbed for my pulse just in his waking up sleep state because it would have been on his mind and he he said to me oh your pulse is very thready I, you go are you okay I'm going to get you to hospital and I just said no I'm fine don't think I'm going to die again I'm <laughs> didn't come back to I, I felt I was back in my body I was back in pain I was back in ex that beautiful period of no pain I was back in excruciating pain and trying to breathe and my chest was I had pericarditis I had a very tight chest so I couldn't lie down I was sitting up mm. when your heart is inflamed and got a lot of fluid around it you can't lie down so I was sitting up in bed trying to sleep sitting up and my neck was stiff with meningitis so I couldn't move my head so I do remember lying not moving <laughs> And I don't, I don't think I slept that night much at all, but I felt very connected still, like I was half there, half here. And in a sense, you still mm. are like that, aren't you? Mm. That hasn't shifted a lot. And I, in the weeks to follow, I ended up getting the new drug um, within the next, I think it came through three weeks later, but I ended up back in hospital having more intensive prednisolone infusions and then I started the new biologic drug which was also infused in oncology over the next six months and I came back with the knowledge that while I would have still a lot of health issues to get through that I would survive and I would survive to tell this story to spread the word to hopefully help the love revolution to get it started, to be a part of it, to help awaken. And it's a pretty exciting time to be here. However, it has been the reintegration back into human form is, I'm not going to say challenging, interesting. It's very interesting to try and navigate the human, humanness of this existence after having the glimpse of that magnificent magnificent place that we call home and I think that was part of what I was trying to work with over the last four years has been all those aspects of reintegration 
and trying to work out what it all what it all means to me on a personal level as well as how do I best how do I best move forward with this so yeah. that I can do what I'm here to do but there have been moments where like you know I cannot do time I yeah. I just can't do time anymore which is a really frustrating thing for people around me but I'm just very much in the now the now's all we really all we have and everything is in it every moment is in the now so when you were falling and you saw your past lives we call them past lives mm. but actually they're all unfolding right now yes yeah, so as i as i was watching them do you remember like the old jukeboxes how you have records lined yes. up stacked up in a jukebox and you press a number and an arm goes and picks one and brings it out yep. and plays a track on that particular record. Yep. So it doesn't play the whole record, it plays one track. Yeah. It's as if so, but they all exist at once. Yeah, all they're those all, records are they're there. They're all in the jukebox yeah. together and they all exist stacked up together. That's how I would give a physical representation of time, meaning it's stacked not linear not in a linear fashion yeah it's stacked in a horizontal fashion but then remember it's also interacting with space and energy so it's fluid and it's dynamic and it's a unified field within this interconnected relationship within energy and space but let's just take time out and look at time on its we're going to just pull it out of the equation and look at it on its own it's stacked so that my little awareness can so what plays in front of you, your awareness it can only your your awareness, whatever it places itself on, is what will play in front of you. So if I place my awareness on you, then I see what's in front of me. You're sitting in front of me. If I place my awareness in that realm, my awareness could be placed on a life that I lived four hundred years ago, and that's what will play in front of me to watch because it's energetically stored in consciousness in all consciousness the energetic representation of that physical life is stored remember it's stamped with intent into mm. consciousness so it's stored and i can view it and then i can pop it back in with the rest of the records and i can grab another one out and watch another one so they're all playing they, they're all there Mm. So what my awareness looks at will be what's playing in front of me. So while we're here in this life, our awareness is fully on this life. Yes. So it's all we see. We see what our reality that's unfolding in front of us is all our awareness can perceive because we are in a very dense energetic vibrational frequency that sort of prohibits us from accessing from our awareness being able to perceive the other representations that are stored within so the other lifetimes yes. but they they are existing stacked on top of each other mm. so the death experience challenges that prohibition and seems to allow it seems to enable it mm. so you you sensed in a flash as you fell it was like so those, many of those lives do you know those little books and you flick through them and that the starts picture. yeah it's a little picture and it starts yeah. with one little stick thing yeah. and then as you flick through it it becomes a whole drawing yeah it was like flicking through that but each page was a different life okay okay gotcha. that quick like yeah oh in that country as that person looking like that that was my name that's what i did but the one thing that i was very aware of flicking through them all was in each lifetime i was a healer that's of some sort what i wanted to ask you about the soul mm. seed mm. the soul so seed that's what my, you call it the from soul my seed. understanding there is a soul seed within us all that we are here to express we are all here with a united purpose and that is to fully realize and express the truth of our soul the magnificent truth of our soul which is you are love i am love we're all here to fully fully 
realize that express it and live that fully the expression of your soul and that's your soul purpose but i feel that we have an individual meaning that we apply in each lifetime to that purpose and that meaning is built on your soul seed and my soul seed is a healer so each lifetime it will represent itself somewhat differently but it's also about always healing through plant medicine through cardiac medicine Mm. through it's always a form of that and quite often as a healer's daughter which was another interesting thing that's interesting oh i didn't realize that Mm. so a medicine man and you're the daughter yes you had told me about the native american Mm. life as yeah. um, the daughter of a medicine man, mm. yeah. And also knowing that that medicine man in that life was the father that I have had in this life. Yeah, cardiac same, specialist in same this soul. life. Yeah. Your mentor. And yeah. mentor. he's mentored me in many lives. Yeah. We have a very strong soul connection and we seem to have this connection that benefits all we choose. Um, another one I was didn't like I was dressed in all brown and I don't like brown so but anyway not judging (laughs) she wasn't really dressed in clothes I would pick now (laughs) but I I knew I was an author and I wrote but I didn't do that as my profession I did it on the side and I knew I hid my writing under a desk leather desk console but I did it at night And I did enjoy doing, I enjoyed writing, but I worked as a nurse in that lifetime. Mm. So I was a nurse, but I wrote at night and I loved both, Mm. which is interesting because I've started writing again only recently. And I found I quite love it, Mm. which is very surprising. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not saying I'm great at it, but I do love it. So we'll see. That's really interesting Mm. because that very much echoes that life which... I think we we were trying to figure out earlier or it was might have been in the Edwardian period so the yes the, maybe 1910 or something like that I felt it was between World War 1 and World War 2 Oh okay I thought it was in that period I, think I can't that is. Give I've you got to check if that's yeah I okay I can't give you the exact year but it was a very quick review of them all like flicking through yeah. them all very quickly and I can have a sense of that one was 200 years ago, that was 400 years, but I can't tell you it was the exact year it was. I'm not privy to that. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't given that sort of mm. detail. Mm. Maybe it doesn't matter, probably not. But the soul seed idea is fascinating and, of course, you've come back. You're still a healer. Mm. However, your mode of healing has changed mm. since your return. You're no longer the cardiac diagnostic imaging specialist mm. that you were, that were, you were very driven in your career mm. prior, taking after your dad. And I did lo- like, I, it you was loved it. so fulfilling. Yeah. It was such a fulfilling life. I, I loved every moment of it. I loved my patients. I, I would never have stopped doing that work if I hadn't got too sick to do it. But now I'm being very called to do a different sort of healing and I'm very interested in how that looks like with soul work and it's sort of almost like I don't have a choice because every time I go to try and do something else I find myself back writing about this or Mm. trying to develop programs around it and you've got so much on the go and there's so much that I think Mm. we well I don't think I know we're going to go on to talk about (laughs) so maybe we should talk about the very exciting things that are developing and it is very interesting, just quickly referencing back to the last time we spoke, which was mm. four years ago. And I, d- I don't listen to myself. I have never listened to our interviews. I don't like listening to my voice. And I have, I often, you know, we often talk and you say, oh, say that again. I have, I have no idea what I say, Karina. It just <laughs> comes out. I, I, I don't remember what I said, but I quickly popped it on in the car on the way over just the last two minutes and to refresh where we finished off and I had no idea that way back then and we hadn't met 
we hadn't yeah, met we at that hadn't point. Yeah, we hadn't met in person. That's no. true. We had you had called me to ask me to interview, but we had not yeah. met. We had not spoken personally. And at the end of that interview, two weeks before, I think it was, or three weeks, it had been brought to me over a five-day period by a stranger and by a book and by a magazine and articles, this Camino walk that I had yeah. never heard about. I had no idea what it was. So in the fortnight prior to our interview, mm. this had happened five times. Okay. Yeah. So I... <laughs> decided I better look into it because obviously I now know if something keeps being thrown in front of me in my awareness pay attention and my magic number is three three times you've got my attention okay I've got to pay attention to this this is important for some reason the third time I was sitting in a waiting room and it was a magazine sitting on the only chair left and it was all about the Camino (laughs) and it was Three people's story about illness such as cancer, just finishing on, you know, with their chemotherapy. One lady didn't go on to have chemotherapy but decided it was part of her cancer healing journey. And I think another one was, it might have been MS in the early stages of diagnosis. But there were following the stories of these ladies and their journey across Spain and I started reading them as I was sitting in the waiting room to go into my appointment and I was absolutely transfixed at the tr- the power that this walk seemed to have mm. the tr- the transformation and the power and I had also been bouncing around in my little mind the idea of establishing a charity for autoimmune disease so I could raise money for much needed research into better diagnostics, better treatments, hopefully one day a cure. I'm very driven to do that and in the last four years I've done that I've established the charity called the Autoimmune Project and we raise funds and Karina is part of that now. You've come on on the board with me and we raise funds for mainly for research i'm very very aware that that's a very important crucial area to for funds to go and also awareness so that yes 80 percent of people are, are women with autoimmune disease and like i did i had months of symptoms before i even considered they could be symptoms for something else and even prior to that, I had years of things going on that we kept saying, well, that's bad luck. That's really bad luck, but that's bad luck. I probably could have been diagnosed seven, eight years earlier. Yeah. Potentially the treatment may have halted the progression. There is, like I said, there's no cure. And the healthy me is not what I used to be. But it's, it's, it's good, but I still have... I still have flares, I still have arthritis, I still have days when my brain is so foggy and confused and it's hard to think through the fog. All the usual Mm -hmm. extreme fatigue, all the usual, I have moments like that. And then I have days where I have energy and I've just learnt to be kind to myself. What my body needs, I give it. If it needs rest, I give it rest. If I've got a bit of energy, then I do a lot more. (laughs) And... I'm very passionate about awareness campaigns about symptoms, what to keep an eye out on, how to be kind to yourself, how do you live going forward with an autoimmune diagnosis. I'm very, very proud of our charity and I'm very excited that we're going to do our walk. Yes, and that's what you were going to say Mm -hmm. before. You were going to tell how in the fortnight before our interview... (laughs) That I, deci- I somehow decided this is what I would do. I would walk the Camino, which is 800 kilometres. <laughs> and I did work out the other day that's a million steps. Which is a beautiful number. Mm, a million steps. We're so, walking a million steps. So in that interview, as we were signing mm, off, I had no memory of this. You reminded me of this today. Mm, we played it the last mm, two minutes. You said, I'm going on the Camino. Mm, and then you said to me, 
you better start training. And I said, I'm coming. And they were our last <laughs> words. And then we signed off. And we're going. And today. In less than three weeks yeah. from today, by the time I publish this, it's probably, might be the eve of it, mm. of our departure. We're going to go. And that is a magnificent way of highlighting how your awareness creates what your reality, what you will step into. And we had no idea way, way, way four years ago that we would be sitting here now as best friends. It's extraordinary. We had never met. Yeah. Now we have the most beautiful friendship. Yeah. We've managed to spend a year or two now really putting together all the fine touches of how we're going to do this amazing walk you've done a lot you've done it all Sarah I've just watched on in awe as you've put those amazing organizational (laughs) skills to to use but it's we we as anybody who's listening can tell we have so much to talk about Mm. so much and we even though we've been talking now for I don't know a couple of hours (laughs) we've we've probably only skimmed the surface Mm. so we decided (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that we need a yes. we need a podcast, a different one. Mm. Yeah, and so we're calling Very it. Excited. We're calling mm. it soul to soul conversations. Yeah, because that's what we do. That's what we do all the time. We it, just have these amazing soul to soul conversations, and it struck me. Maybe it was last week that we were discussing this. How I came back knowing that. We are doing here what we do when we transition, and that is our souls communicate with one another. We do it in an energetic telepathic form in the non-physical world, but we do it in physical, we do it here. Our souls are communicating. We're just going to do it out loud. We're going to have the conversations of our souls out loud about everything. Yeah. All, All that this human existence and soul existence the common the uncommon and we will interview we'll have interviews with people yeah yeah interesting guests look out for it we're about to launch it Mm -hmm. we will be launching it on the Camino how exciting at the foot of the Pyrenees I believe in Saint Jean Pierre de Port (laughs) if we don't get blown away it may be too slight slight problem it may be too windy and that little plan to do it up in the pyramid <laughs> may not come off we might get blown away but we will do it somewhere there even if it's in the hotel room or i'm just so delighted mm. to have this opportunity and we will we will talk more about this when we actually launch the show mm. and get into our conversations but anybody who's been listening to my show for all these years knows that my soul has been calling me to have these mm. conversations and i have invited mm. i think up until this point 75 guests or something onto the show to talk about the spirit Mm. the soul the invisible world you know Mm. and it's very interesting we we talked we touched on this because your slogan Mm. or one of the i guess one of the slogans that you have Mm. for the autoimmune project is making the invisible visible Mm. and in a way that's what i've been doing too my whole life isn't that interesting? I actually didn't make that connection because autoimmune disease is very invisible. Yeah. You can look very healthy on the outside while there's a war raging on the inside. However, we are all walking around in this human jumpsuit and the soul is within us and it's the, invis- it's the invisible to the human perception exactly. sometimes, unless you start awakening and have the awareness and go within and start, start discovering you oh my goodness and I feel like Mm. I don't have a memory of an NDE but I feel like I was born Mm. knowing that there Mm. is something invisible that's powerful Mm. and it's it's communicating and it loves you and it wants the best for you I Mm. somehow knew all these things not that I would have voiced it in that way Mm. so everything that I've worked towards in life has been about raising awareness of the invisible <laughs> you, been, you have been an awareness campaigner for decades i have i honestly it is i know your soul seed is to write but also to be a connector and you do do that beautifully you connect these beautiful soul stories that have been I've, i listen to your episodes more than once i have to admit apart from the ones i did 
Um, and you do, you connect these beautiful stories and people together and souls together. Oh. And it's been, it's just been the most amazing experience. And I, I will say like ride of a lifetime to have been, to have met you, to have come the last four years has just been magnificent absolutely magnificent and I'm I will say in no small part because you've walked into my life oh Sarah and you've it's helped, so beautiful you've helped give me what I needed the courage to have a voice to honor what I know I'm here to do and I don't know that I would have been able to do it without you so thank you well I can echo your words mm-hmm. almost to a T well, if not exactly, mm. I feel exactly the same. And that's why we're launching our podcast mm. because we're going to talk about this incredible connection, mm. but also keep on talking about all of the yeah. all of the it's wonderful important. learnings, yeah. I guess, or the downloads. There's so much more. Mm. I mean, we really have only skimmed the surface of your experience today. Yes. So mm. so that's why we need a whole podcast to do mm. it. And we need, you know, to just keep talking about making the invisible visible because that's a healing journey Mm. understanding that it would be lovely if just if soul to soul conversations if it just ripples out and one by one there's this realization of yes we're love we're here to be love and this is this is really the job of the soul that's if we could all turn to love instead of worrying about how we can do it or how we can change the world or it's simple love we can we can change everything in a day if we want to if we all just wake up and choose love we would change everything and i feel very powerfully about having having a wonderful platform with which we can talk about the things that we don't normally talk about there are a lot of fluff conversations out there yeah. i'm really interested in the big ones oh, and the little ones I'm actually interested in all of them, actually. <laughs> Correction. I love them all. I love all, all our conversations. We will have the website up and running alongside the podcast and we will, we will have a Camino series while we're away. But when we get back, we will have a platform where we're going to invite a question, send a question and we'll talk about it. Yeah. And have a soul-to-soul conversation with us. Yep. So if yeah. today, our conversation today has inspired you or has piqued your curiosity, jot down your questions. Yeah. You can email me. We'll have links yeah. by the end of, by the time this is published. So so I think yeah. that's it for today, Sarah. Yeah. So we'll see you on the Camino, everybody. Oh, I know. <laughs> How exciting. We'll um, put a photo of us up in our hiking boots. <laughs> says the girl who's never done hiking before other than now (laughs) yeah anyway we'll see everyone on day zero we will come to you live from the pyrenees oh my goodness (laughs) (laughs) that sounds very adventurous thank you sarah okay thank you very much karina as always amazing to talk to you likewise darling thank you so much for coming on that's quite (laughs) all right i will speak to everyone under soul to soul in three weeks yep so, or we'll, it'll be when you pop, when you deliver this it'll be probably the next day hang with we'll us we'll be jet lagged we'll be jet lagged uh, hang with <laughs> us as we walk the talk yes <laughs> oh, that's so good I love that okay thank you very much bye darling bye thank you for listening to Spirit Sisters if you enjoyed this conversation please subscribe so that you won't miss an episode and don't forget to rate and review the show have an experience you'd like to share with me get in touch at my website karinamachado.com or find me on Facebook at Karina Machado Author. After all, there's nothing more powerful than a story.